This video was brought to you by my patrons. Thanks! Okay, so hello everybody. We did it! 100k! I'm gonna be honest, I don't want to hit 1 million, that seems like too many people. But 100k was a nice round number, and also supposedly YouTube is going to send me a thing, and I didn't get a lot of trophies in school, so I find that concept pleasing. But uh, this is gonna be pretty laid back. I have my recording set up, but I'm not wearing my headphones. Another quick note, there were some repeat questions, but you know, for ease's sake, I'm not going to aggregate every person who asked a thing, so if you don't hear your name, but you also asked the same question, I'm sorry. Also, I apologize in advance if I fuck up anybody's names. I'm doing my best, I swear. Okay, so. Respected Face asks, Favorite fandom ships and why? Probably Poe and Finn in the new Star Wars, Cassian and Jin in Rogue One, Herman Gottlieb and Newton Geisler from Pacific Rim, and Kaz and Inej from Six of Crows. There is a tragic lack of lesbian ships that I go hard for, I know. I feel like a terrible queer, but Portrait of a Lady on Fire made me cry, so... Yeah. As for why, um, the, the feelings. Caitlin White asks, number one, who are your favorite authors? Marcus Susak and Tamara Pierce. Also, I'm pretty sure some of her work is a little problematic, but I really love a lot of Rainbow Rowell's work as well. And number two, how do you get inspiration to write about shows? I believe I once told somebody it was like exercising a demon. There's a very specific level of interest and fixation that leads to videos. There's a lot of stuff that I just like a ton, and that's it. And then there's stuff that I like in a way that makes me want to dig into it and see what makes it tick. Or, like, I can tell I have some big brain ideas about that piece of media that would be interesting to talk about. Number three, is there any piece of work that's affected you so much that you can't bring yourself to write about it because the feelings around it are so complicated? I'm not sure. There are pieces that are difficult to write about, but it's not because of that specifically. It's more like trying to verbalize ideas is hard sometimes. Damiano Coretta asks, Do you read fantasy as a genre, especially epic fantasy? I do read fantasy. I'm not sure it would be considered epic fantasy, though. Uh, Tamara Pierce, Lee Bardugo, and Sarah Rees Brennan, for example. Also Rainbow Rowell's Simon Snow series. I think my tastes still lean kind of YA despite being an adult. Don't know what that's about. Reese's Peanut Butter Cups asks, How do you pick topics and ideas for a video? Does it start with something you enjoy, which you then find a way into for a video? Wow, I can't believe Reese's watches my videos! I love your candy! No, okay. Uh, for real though, you hit the nail right on the head, actually. That's precisely it. If it's been covered a bit, like Rogue One or Doctor Who, I might do a little digging into what other people have said, because if I feel somebody already has communicated all the points I would say, then there isn't much point for me to make a video. Like, everybody has done videos on Mad Max Fury Road, so I would have literally nothing to add except I did scream witness me out the window of my car while driving home from the theater. Ali W asks, what books slash movies got you to love analyzing things? Well, the Lord of the Rings trilogy got me interested in filmmaking and the extensive behind the scenes materials which went into such detail explaining so many ins and outs of the story really intrigued me. I think there were some films like Memento or Take Shelter where I got really curious about why the creators made the choices they did. I don't know, it's probably a lot of movies, but I can't remember single titles. At In Media Raz asks, how do you think having ADHD changes the way you analyze media? I'm not sure. I know it affects my workflow, making it really hard sometimes to get work done, or sometimes I work obsessively and get a video done in a month instead of two. As for the analysis, I mean, there is something to be said for the hyperfocus that makes me revisit things multiple times and just sit and think about them a lot. I guess maybe ADHD contributes to that sort of fixation that makes me want to take a piece apart and study why it makes me feel things. Bethany Smith asks, do you have a favorite video essay that you've done so far? If so, which one and why? Jojo Rabbit, without question. It's just the best thing I will ever make in which I had a real point to make about representation of Jewish people in Holocaust films and about people's perceptions surrounding Jews in those stories. Like, I just peaked early and I've accepted that. Christian Marchand asks, number one, 
what has been the most emotionally challenging video to make, Jojo Rabbit again. I had to watch a lot of difficult films and a lot of bad films, and the days spent looking at real Holocaust footage were very grim. Number two, have any pieces of media that you've made a video about upon revisiting for said video had more problematic elements than you first realized when you fell in love with it, the first time causing a clash between your previous nostalgic slash positive feelings and the previously unrecognized problematic elements? Um, not really? Not that I've noticed. I don't revisit stuff that often anymore and my earliest video is only about two years old. Maybe in ten years some of my takes will have aged badly or seem short-sighted, but so far I think the issues are more or less covered, although I think my tackling of problematic elements was a little rough in the early days. I probably could have phrased things better on some of the earlier videos. Peyton Steiner asks, do you, or did you, ever have to overcome anything like anxiety when making or preparing for a video? Yes. Every single time. All the time. Some videos make me more anxious than others, but I inevitably hit a block on every video at least once, usually more than once. Arc Tangent asks, which portion of your process is the most exhilarating and which the most draining? Honestly, the best part of the video is when it's done. That's pretty satisfying. Otherwise, I usually have a lot of fun when I come up with those really stupid jokes and visual gags, like the zooms and the text on screen, all that. My least favorite part is probably recording the voiceover. Literally any section of audio in any video probably was double the length in the recording process because I fuck up a lot, and I especially loathe re-recording and re-editing sections. There is something about that which requires so much patience. Q Walu is writing asks, How do you decide which movie slash show to do a video essay on? What was your very first approach to it like? So I know I already answered that first question earlier, but my first approach to one of these videos was mostly just that I had some very specific ideas about the Adventure Zone and like Shakespeare and stuff, and nobody seemed to be talking about that online, so I decided to try. Kiwalu also asks, What is your MBTI type? I have no idea. I did a quick Google, and apparently that test has 99 questions, and I'm not a patient person. Declan Murphy asks, What are your inspirations for your video essays, like other video essayists? So, I'm not sure I'm specifically inspired by other essayists anymore, at least when it comes to style. I think there are loads of talented people doing work I love and respect, but now that I've found a style, I'm not looking to other essayists for inspiration on that. I just watch other essayists because I like the form and I admire their work. When I started, I was inspired by people like Lindsay Ellis, Filmjoy, Jenny Nicholson, and What's So Great About That. But I am still learning stuff all the time from the work being done by other creators like Khadija Bo, Princess Weeks, Yara Zaid, Broey Deschanel, Curio, Shona Lika, CJ the X, and Breadsword. I feel like there are a lot of people doing amazing work, and sometimes I just feel like my understanding of the world and of media expands when I watch their stuff. Sharon Horowitz asks, Are there any musicals you would consider covering on the channel? Not at this time. Most of my favorite musicals are like very specific productions of stage musicals. While I love a lot of movie musicals, and I covered the Brandy Cinderella on my Patreon, I'm not sure I love any movie musicals enough for a full-length essay. Lucas Brown asks, If you had to choose one, would you rather inhabit a character from season one or two of the Haunting of Hill House series? Um, so maybe Owen from Bly Manor, because he deals with the least amount of creepy shit, and uh, I would drop dead if I had to deal with what Theo or Danny has been through. I love this name. Billiam McGonagall asks, do you have a background in film or writing? Yes, I have a film degree and a creative writing minor, and I've worked professionally as a film editor. Louis, oh god, Louis... La Lefebvre. <laughs> this is what you don't hear most of the time, but but we're keeping it in. Louis La Lefebvre. Lefebvre. Le Lefebvre. <laughs> Louis La Lefebvre asks, 
What would you choose to do if you could do anything other than being a brilliant video essayist as a calling? First off, thank you for that editorializing. That's very kind. Um, preferably video editing on like proper movies or TV shows. At some point, I do hope to maybe write and direct my own films, but like, we'll see. Isabel Henry asks, what films or shows are you planning on making videos on? So right now I am most of the way done through writing an outline for the entire Pacific Rim franchise. I'm going to do a video on like all Pacific Rim. I've also been researching for uh, another retrospective like the MASH video about Stargate SG-1. Um, by the way, I tend to announce this stuff a lot more on my Twitter at BotYouLubel if y'all want to check that out. I don't like to announce too much because I feel like I change my mind kind of a lot. Sophia Forshi asks, what did you think about the movie Promising Young Woman? I've heard really mixed reviews and would love to hear your take on it. I also feel really mixed about Promising Young Woman. Um, I would recommend reading the negative reviews specifically written by women, there's a lot there that I feel I have difficulty reconciling, um, because I was very entertained by parts of the movie, but I am very conflicted by other parts. Matthew Knights asks, what is your personal favorite movie of all time? I usually answer the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Guillaume Pierre. Oh, this is a French name. Gwillem? Jesus. Um, Pierre asks, number one, what is the first movie you remember watching? I think I remember seeing either the first Toy Story or a Goofy movie in theaters. Um, other than that, no idea. Number two, which movie do you pick spontaneously when being asked what is your favorite movie and which one is really your favorite one? So, I said Lord of the Rings just before, but real favorite is hard to say. I genuinely have a hard time picking favorites. I've got a letterbox list of favorite movies, and I love all of them. Number three, how did you end up making video essays on YouTube? I was unemployed and a little bit stuck, and I just had a lot of time on my hands, but the inclination had been growing for a while, so I just went for it. Number four, are there some French movies you know or like especially? Amelie and Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Jehani asked, As a fellow fan of the Happy Death Day movies, I was curious if you had seen Christopher Landon's most recent film, Freaky, and if so, what did you think of it? I did see it. It was cute. It didn't rock my world, but I liked it. Jordan asks, what media do you wish that you had had a part in making? Maybe because it was a good time for those who did, or it's important and you wish you could have been a part of it. So it's tempting to say something like Lord of the Rings for this, because the behind the scenes of those movies look really fun, and those are some of my favorite movies, but also the behind the scenes look incredibly strenuous, and realistically, the movies turned out as perfectly as they did because of all the individuals that were working on them at the time. I mean, like, I doubt an editor or assistant editor really would have changed, like, the makeup of it, but also, why fuck with perfection? Selfishly, I would have loved to be involved in the post-production of Rogue One, just because it could have allowed me to see some of those scenes that didn't make it into the final cut, and maybe help make it a better movie, although given all of the studio interference, that's probably unlikely. Ira Renee Covillon asks, what themes seem to really excite you? I notice low-key romance, found family, and dealing with suffering. That is bang on, actually. I really love media that deals with trauma, specifically recovering from trauma. I do love found family stuff. I love romance. I also love stories about families becoming like better families and forming unlikely relationships or friendships. Simsilica asks, what is your favorite fic trope to read versus your favorite fic trope to write? Um, I love hurt comfort fic. Um, I don't write as much sick fic, but I love reading it. But in general, I like reading and writing hurt comfort. Blake Swihart asks, what are some of your go-to comfort movies? I feel like my comfort media changes pretty often, but when it comes to movies, it's a lot of like, rom-coms or period romance films in general. Um, 
The Keira Knightley Pride and Prejudice, Miss Pettigrew Lives for a Day, The Decoy Bride, Someone Like You, the literary Guernsey Potato Peel Society, that really stupid long title movie is very cute. So yeah, those. Wayne asks, preferred snacks and drinks for watching movies or binging shows. So I don't have preferred snacks um, for watching TV and stuff, but during quarantine, I have discovered a love for ginger beer. It, uh, it's like the non-alcoholic spicy ginger ale. <laughs> also, I really like those um, blended taro tea drinks with like red bean and the jellies in them. Um, but mostly I tend to snack a lot more when I'm editing. Wayne also asks if I like shows to have a whole season released at once or weekly. And honestly, both are good. I don't have a strong preference. They just create different viewing experiences. Zachary L. asked, favorite Kingdom Hearts moment? <laughs> oh my god. Well, if we're talking real moments, the bit in Kingdom Hearts 3 when Donald and Goofy bring Sora back from the dead with the power of friendship wrecked my shit. This is the death screen! This is the screen! All right, now I'm holding my controller up to the microphone and I really hope you guys can hear it. Oh, do you hear it? If we're talking about very funny moments, I'm really fond of the entire very dramatic time that Goofy died in Kingdom Hearts 2 with Mickey Mouse saying, They'll pay for this. And then he just shows up later and says, You know, that really hurt. Fucking classic. Yersi Fennell asks, how do you approach research for a video? Um, honestly, it depends, but often I will start with whatever bonus features are available if there is physical media available for the thing I'm covering. Commentaries are an excellent primary source for insight into the process of a creator. In some cases, the bonus features actually are enough to provide all the background I need on the movie itself. For other topics, I end up covering tangentially, um, Wikipedia is an excellent resource because every citation leads you to sources, and then you can go read those sources. There are things like match cuts or the Kuleshov effect or whatever that I have a general knowledge about, but I need like a dictionary definition and a little refresher course for me. On the last two videos, there was a lot of Googling and then reaching out to sensitivity readers who like reviewed those sections of the video in the outline form and the final video and provided feedback. In some cases, they sent me more resources and stuff, which was super great. With Miss Fisher in particular, I floundered a bit initially just because there was very little covering Miss Fisher and the lack of indigenous representation, so like, yeah, some people might remember a day when I tweeted asking for, like, some places to get started with research. Honestly, I'm not that great of a researcher, uh, but the internet is full of people who know things and are happy to share knowledge if you ask. Now that I have a larger platform, I can just go on Twitter and be like, hey, I can't find a source for this fact, anybody know anything? And people will just respond. It's really great. Very kind. I'm a big fan. Ethan Duncan asks, when researching a topic, at what point do you feel like you have enough knowledge to comfortably talk about a subject? So as previously stated, I'm actually not that great of a researcher. You might notice I link to a lot more articles than full books because my attention span is pretty limited and I find it easier to digest short bursts of information. I'm not going to read a 100 page study, but I will try to at least skim it if I'm going to list it in my sources. Honestly, half the time when I'm getting into the really nitty gritty stuff, I'm just doing my best to coagulate all the information I've read into something that is cogent and accurate. I probably never have enough knowledge to talk about the things I talk about. I am just doing my best making dumb videos online. Void Pumpkin asks, if you could review an album the same way you review movies and TV shows, what would it be and why? Also, what is your favorite film slash TV show soundtrack? Oh my god. I mean, I don't know if I could review an album the way I do a movie or TV show. I'm really big into Florence and the Machine. I love all of her albums, but um, yeah, I don't know how that would work. Once when I was a kid, I tried to communicate my love for a particular track from the Two Tower soundtrack by like scribbling lines in my journal. It was kind of like waveforms, but I didn't know what waveforms were yet. I don't know how I would review an album since aggressive singing or humming doesn't really count as a review. As for favorite film and TV soundtracks, 
oh boy, here we go. This isn't even a comprehensive list, but like, this is a smattering of my favorites. Okay. So the Lord of the Rings soundtracks by Howard Shore are just stunning from end to end. I really love the 2004 Lemony Snicket series Unfortunate Events soundtrack by Thomas Newman. Andrew Lockington's score for the 2008 City of Ember movie Nobody Saw rules. And while the last Airbender movie is garbage, James Newton Howard's score for it is bomb, as is the score for Atlantis The Lost Empire. John Powell's score for How to Train Your Dragon is also nonstop bangers. The Cloud Atlas score by Tom Teekford, Johnny Klemek, and Reinhold Hale is really beautiful. I love Philip Glass's score for The Illusionist. It's really pretty. Daniel Pemberton's scores on Into the Spider-Verse and Man from U.N.C.L.E. are a really good time. The Pirates of the Caribbean score by Claus Bedelt and the scores for Dead Man's Chest and Now World's End by Hans Zimmer are a delight. Although Zimmer really phoned it in on the fourth one, just saying. Nicholas Hooper's score for Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix is, I think, highly underrated. Although, obviously, John Williams' score for Prisoner of Azkaban is another favorite. And I have loved all of Michael Giacchino's work on the J.J. Abrams Star Trek films. Also, nobody talks about Bruno Collet's enough. He did the score for Coraline, as well as The Secret of Kells and The Song of the Sea, and his work is gorgeous. Oh, and there's a film by Jean-Pierre Gionnet called Micmax. The score by Raphael Bo kicks ass. And sorry if I butchered those names, don't at me for my bad French. And while I haven't dug into the entire scores for Us and Get Out because they're spooky, Michael Abel's main themes for both films are just haunting and beautiful. Javier Neverete's score for Pan's Labyrinth is so perfect and I find myself humming the lullaby anytime I think about the movie for more than two seconds. Elon Eshkeri's score for the 2007 Stardust rules, and I love Rachel Portman's score for Chocolat. Oh, and thank you to whatever Twitter user directed me towards Tamar Kali's work on Mudbound. It's gorgeous. I was not paying enough attention to the music when I first watched that movie. As for TV, I find the landscape of TV soundtracks is often a little less exciting, but Bear McCreary's work on Battlestar Galactica was phenomenal, and Joseph Trapanese's work on Shadow and Bone Season 1 kicked serious ass, Ramin Jawadi's work on Westworld has been super cool, and I think I've said before, uh, Murray Gold's work on Doctor Who was consistently excellent for 10 years, with a lot of particular highlights. Obviously I like the score for season 9, but also seasons 2, 3, and 5. I could keep going, but I have so many favorites, I have to stop. Kivine at GM Galaxy Master asks, Besides Kingdom Hearts and The Last of Us, are there any other gaming series you've ever considered making content for? Um. At some point, I might make something about Greece and Celeste. I'm finding that in general, I usually prefer more indie games because often they have simpler mechanics that are easier for me to learn. Joepi is sketching asked, For your Nebula shorter videos, what movies will you be reviewing soon? How do you go about choosing which ones to make? So I'm going to answer this one a little circuitously. Uh, for those who aren't in the know, on my Patreon and on Nebula, I release a monthly short movie review. I call these LK's monthly movies. They're like two to five minutes long, usually. As for how I choose them or which movies I'll be reviewing, honestly, I don't plan those either. I usually look at what's nearby and decide what I think I'll be in the mood to talk about over the next few weeks. I always find those short videos satisfying, but there are times when it's hard to tear myself away from my bigger project or just like get up the juice to make those little guys. They're quick, but they still take time and focus, so I usually just sort of look at my DVD shelf and pick some stuff. The only requisite is that I don't think I would make a longer video about said title. Oh, and on Patreon, I let patrons vote from like two or three titles, so that is the final choosing factor. One day, Spice World will win one of those polls, and then I will find a way to coherently do a review that isn't just me belting out Spice Girls. Griffin slash Worm asks, What's something you would never review, but still want to recommend slash talk about? Honestly, there's loads of media that I recommend, but I'll never talk about in depth. Um... Part of the fun of those short reviews I've been doing is I feel less of a burden if it's just a five minute video of me saying go watch this movie. But for the more in-depth videos, I'm never going to talk about something like Lilo and Stitch or Mulan. 
There are pieces where I, as a white lady, am probably not the right person to talk about this in some long-form video because there's so much of it that feels tied up in experiences and cultures that I don't know and am not a part of. At some point I realized as an outsider it's a lot easier to talk about the quantity of representation rather than the quality of it. I don't know if it's possible for me to do enough research to accurately talk about a piece of media that is so specific to a culture I'm not a part of. This might not be a perfect approach, and I am open to changing this stance in the future, but that's been the route I've taken so far. Also, there are loads of movies that I really like and recommend, but I don't have long-form, big-brain ideas about them. That doesn't lessen the amount that I like those movies, uh, just sometimes I don't have an hour of thoughts. I just like a thing. Great Brown Hope asks, it's great that your video had a segment about the issues surrounding the natives of Australia. However, don't you think to then move on to how great the show is anyways diminishes the PSA that came before? It glorifies something that maybe shouldn't be glorified, or do you think we should separate the art from the real world issues? So this is really complicated. Um, this channel is specifically meant to be about things I like. That's the only pedestal I'm trying to put things on. It's a pedestal that says, I like this. It could be trash or high art or both. I don't think my love of a piece of media diminishes its problematic elements. This is why I talk about viewing things critically. I think it's possible to love something and recognize its flaws. Like, find me an unproblematic piece of media because you will be looking for a long time. Did you know that Steve Mnuchin, yes that one, uh, produced The Lego Movie and Mad Max Fury Road? Art is complicated, and I think it's important to live in the uncomfortable gray area of recognizing the flaws in something and celebrating the good in it. I tend to put those problems pretty close to the front of the video because if somebody sees that and says, I am done with this video and this piece of media, I think that's really valid. I'm still learning about the best way to communicate this, and I'm always trying to impart to the audience that if these problems make this show or movie unwatchable for you, that is totally fine. And I don't know if it's about separating art from real-world issues, I just think every individual person has their own level of what they can watch and not watch in things. I talked about this in the Art vs. the Artist video, but a lot of media is problematic or made by problematic people, and I don't think we gain anything by just throwing it all in the bin. I do hope people making art continue to improve and that we hold art accountable when we need to. But I think art that's got a lot of good in it can be appreciated for what's good while still shining a light on the parts that are flawed. I think MASH changed the face of television, and it's also got some really racist and sexist stuff in it. I think it's possible for these two facts to exist simultaneously. Rob underscore Mond asked, Pineapple on pizza, yay or nay? I don't have strong feelings about this, but I'll eat it if it's the only pizza available. And if you notice a sudden change in audio quality, it's because I just noticed a few more questions that I forgot to answer, and uh, fuck it. <laughs> I just pulled my microphone back out, but I didn't do my entire setup. Um, this is chill vibes only. Data Foxy asks, favorite dessert recipe? Um, I'm a terrible cook. But I like ice cream, and I've made chocolate chip cookies. I hope that answers your question. Vama Red asks, How long does it take to make one of your videos? About two months, give or take. October Oddity asks, I'm gonna pop down to the shops. You want anything? Yes, could you get me Starbucks? <laughs> Julia Bleth asks, what's a movie genre you couldn't live without? Rom-coms. I am absolutely trash for rom-coms. And on the flip side, what's a movie genre you're not a fan of? Um, crime movies? I, I find that there's a specific type of pretty much anything Martin Scorsese has directed. Um, you know, Goodfellas, uh, Scarface. 
most crime films are are not really my bag. I don't know what it is. I I wouldn't count Ocean's Eleven in that genre, so I don't know what that genre is. But that genre. <laughs> Elliot K asks. If you watch anime, which is currently your favorite series? I haven't watched a lot of new anime in a long time, but shows I've really loved include Cowboy Bebop, the original Full Metal Alchemist series. Yes, I'm a weird contrarian. I like it more than Brotherhood. And uh, I'm a big fan of Darker Than Black. Uh, Puella Magi Madoka Magica is really great. And obviously it's not a series, but you know, Studio Ghibli films are amazing. And I pretty much love everything by Mamoru Hosoda. At the Sarah Cookie asks, "What film influenced you the most as a child?" Probably Mulan. I really think that that movie like introduced me to the concept of like feminism and girl power and whatever.、Um, Mulan was huge. So I don't really have a cute way to end this.、Um, I. Really appreciate、uh, all the folks who have stuck around. You know, I know there are some people who've been here since the early days. That's really cool. I don't know. I don't have big goals for like growth of the channel. I just thought 100k was a cool, nice round number to hit.、Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. I'm working on Pacific Rim right now,、uh, and yes, I'm going to talk about Uprising. After that, I have no idea. So yeah, that's all for now. Thank you all for watching. Thank you all for subscribing. Smash that like button. I've never said that because it makes me so uncomfortable. But、um, thank you to my patrons, you know, for keeping the lights on at the LK household. So that's all for now, and I'll see you on the next one.